um, afterwards, as well as the PowerPoint and some other follow-up materials. Just wanted to remind everyone that the 2018 All-America City Awards is coming up. It will be taking place in June this year. Um, and it also has a focus on equity, and we encourage you all to check that out on our website and consider attending the events in June, which will also coincide with our national conference on local governance with a focus on building community and achieving equity. And as you can see, we've got some really exciting keynote speakers. Um, it is a one-day conference, and we'll be having three tracks of workshops focused on health equity, youth and education, and community and place relations. And there will be a link afterwards for you all to check that out and register. We would love to have you join us. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and start turning it over to Dante. I want to make sure that uh, we have full time for the presentation. And as I said before, Dante James is one of the National Civic League Fellows. And he is gracious enough to present on this webinar for you all today and also to dedicate some time, um, about 15 minutes plus, from 12.30 to 2.30, that's mountain time, um, to dive in deeper with you all and answer some questions and, and help uh, you all continue this work. Also, um, as you all have questions, please go ahead and um, share them in the chat box just to the host, not to everyone, and we will field those questions for Dante. Okay. And I am passing over the presenting to Dante, so give us just one moment as we get that set up. All right, Dante. Good morning and afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to share this conversation with me. Um, let's see if everything's working. It is. So anyway, um, this is uh, the consulting firm that I have now after coming from Portland, after working in Portland for almost six years, running its Office of Equity and Human Rights. So um, and being blessed to be a fellow with the uh, the National Civic League gives me the opportunity to have this conversation in 21st century style with you. So um, the conversation obviously is about equity, how and where, and uh, maybe some why of the need to do this. And so my approach today is, one, understanding that many of you on this call are doing this work already and, and, and experts in your own respective cities, so I appreciate your expertise and participation. And please feel free to share some of the things you're doing and or ask any questions you might have. Uh, today I just want to offer some thoughts and examples of what I've implemented in several different cities. Uh, hello to the folks in Oakland because I spent several months out there implementing their, uh, their race and equity office and, uh, with Tacoma, with, um, with New Orleans, and, and many other cities. So these are just some of the things that, that uh, have worked uh, for me in a way that I've kind of helped share with other cities. Um, it's not comprehensive by any means. It's just kind of a broad overview of some examples that hopefully touch on many of the areas that you're working in. Um, and so I wanted to touch on as many areas as possible, uh, mostly focusing on internal change, culture change. So again, feel free to share some examples from your work. Um, some of you are in office of one, and some will have several staff. Um, each of you probably have different forms of government, from strong mayors to city managers. And so understanding that it impacts and applies differently to you. And, uh, and this is a conversation around equity, not diversity. Um, there'll be some component of diversity in this, obviously, but that's, that's really not uh, where I'm focusing on at this point, although we'll have a conversation on HR. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. so where and how do I start? Um, my, my first answer or question is you have to be able to answer the question, why do we need to focus on race? Because if you can't answer that question, then there's nowhere to start, because that's what everybody else is going to be asking. And so hopefully you have your own elevator speech, and your staff have the elevator speech about what it is that they do and why. Um, and then the initial work may depend upon your mission or your focus, um, you know, being clear about that and being willing to say no, because I've found that uh, the office tends to be sometimes the, I won't call it the dumping ground, but the focus of 
anything that has to do with people of color, folks will try to send it your way. And so you need to be able to say no sometimes if it just doesn't fit within what you're focusing on. Um, you know, is your goal to be transactional or transformation? Um, you want to play hopscotch and just work on policy, versus policy, 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 or how does that fit into an overall component of culture change? And so really understanding um, and looking at the differences and distinctions between those and knowing what it is that you're trying to reach. And then is your focus internal or external or both? Um, you know, depending upon how maybe your ordinance is written or your, your mission statement is written, are you focusing on the internal aspects of culture change or is your focus uh, external as well? Um, or maybe mainly focused on external engagement with community. Um, and let me also just say, I, I'm going to kind of go through these somewhat fast maybe because I want to certainly be able to provide opportunities for questions as, as we get to the end of this. Um, so in, in looking at an external focus, uh, how do you create, create kind of an inside-outside strategy? How do you um, ensure that the external is also supporting whatever it is that you're doing internally? You know, and then questions are, are you a civil rights office? Um, do you take complaints? Uh, and then how do you manage expectations of the external, of the community, um, which I think is a huge, I found to be a huge component because the community has their own desires and expectations about what it is that you're supposed to be doing. So how do you manage that? Um, and then how do you involve community in your work? And again, how do you get them to kind of push on behalf of your work on the internal side? Um, and then can you engage nonprofits in higher ed to assist? How are, how are those outside entities possibly assisting, providing, you know, data or other kind of research that will support the work that you're trying to do? Um, in Portland, we used uh, the Portland State University did research on black, Latino, Asian, Native, and uh, um, African communities, and it was used extensively. Um, to, to demonstrate where various communities were in the city and the difficulties in, uh, in terms of where they were, uh, the data was really, really helpful all the time. Um, you know, how do you build capacity in community? Because it's always the same people getting asked to come to the meetings and how do you build capacity in people and organizations that uh, they are being invited to the table but even different people are being invited to the table. Um, and then how do you balance engagement with getting the work done expeditiously? And I've always kind of found this to be a tough balancing act because community, the activists in the community want to be involved in every aspect of what's going on and don't always necessarily understand timetables and the time frames and the bureaucracy involved in getting work done. And so how do you you understand the process internally? And, and I've also had to remind community members that just because I work for the city doesn't mean I'm not a community member. So I understand what needs to get done just as much as they do. And also understand sometimes better how to get it done from an internal perspective. So how do you balance that? Um, and those are tough conversations. Um, you obviously have to be willing to take a hit sometimes if you're not engaging and having, you know, nine months of shreds when you can get something done in two months and the same result. So um, it's just a difficult sometimes balancing act. Uh, internally, how do you cultivate or create allies? Uh, my better word is accomplices for the work that you do. Um, you know, the policy program and procedure work, and we're going to address this a little more in depth later, but how do you get the allies and people engaged in doing this work? Um, so how do you ensure that there is internal support for your work? Um, how do you ensure that you are getting supported from the mayor, city manager, chief administrative officer, whoever that may be? And I would suggest that that requires regular meetings because they need to know what it is that's going on and or what it is that you need from them. And they need to be able to answer the questions that they're going to get about the work that you're doing. And in those meetings, I would suggest you set the agenda, um, or at least bring an agenda, or offer an agenda, and then whoever 
your meeting with can also add to it. But you know, you are the one trying to drive the agenda and what it is that you need from your superiors in that regard. Um, department directors, you know, we did quarterly. They were just we just called them uh, equity meetings. They were uh, executive equity committee is just who I call all the department directors. We met on a quarterly basis um, just to talk about equity for an hour. And it provided the opportunity to build allies, but also to utilize those who were already allies and accomplices in the work to share what they were doing with the folks who were on the fence so that folks didn't feel alone in this, that they were stepping out somewhere that they weren't going to get supported and nobody else was doing that work. So it really, it really allowed that colleague to colleague work to happen and embolden other folks to, to kind of get on board and participate. Um, city councils, you know, report and report often. Um, annual reports certainly, but the work that you're doing, you know, maybe 90, 90 days, six months, city council needs to see you and the work you're doing. Certainly if you are working for the mayor, it's a mayor slash legislative form of government, um, and there's enough tension there anyway sometimes. But let council feel that they're a part of this work as well. Um, so those reports, I think, are very, very helpful in doing that. So just being seen often. Being seen often. Um, either having citywide or departmental equity committees. Uh, some departments are much more willing to do it because they have a better understanding of it, uh, or, or trying to com put those components together uh, citywide and have a citywide equity committee made up sometimes of people on the departmental equity committees or not. And I would suggest that it's important to have varieties of uh, folks who have positionality in the city and in the departments. If everybody is a frontline staff, then it's harder to move an agenda. It's harder to comment on policy because folks don't do policy. So you have to have the folks who understand it can do policy work and um, and move that conversation forward. So I'm um, just trying to get the departments individually to do their own equity committees. Uh, sometimes it's difficult. Usually there's a diversity committee. In Portland, there would there was a diversity committee that I just when I got there took and morphed into an equity committee and broadened the scope of what they were doing. Um, for departments, is community involved in uh, strategic planning? Uh, is community but where is community involved in the department? And sometimes that's a scary proposition for a lot of departments because they don't know how to deal with community. They don't know who to go to for community. And so you get to help and guide them in that process of involving community in the work. And then Finally, and I think very importantly, um, how does community know what you're doing? Um, you know, if nature abhors a vacuum, so does community. Because if they don't know what you're doing, they'll make up a story about it and or suggest you're doing nothing. And so for me, it was always important. And I will, I will tell you that when, when I first started the office, um, I didn't have someone doing social media, Facebooking, Twittering, tweeting, I don't do it, but about whatever you call it, all those things. And so community was saying, well, we don't know what you're doing. You must not be doing much of anything. Because I wasn't writing a press release every time I, I got something changed or influenced, you know, had a meeting with the chief of police and influenced a decision. But community didn't really know. And so finding that way to really keep community engaged and involved and aware of what it is that you're doing, I think is a huge component of, of this, no matter whether it's purely internally or you're externally focused, but telling your own story or else they're going to tell it for you and you might not like what they're saying. Um, so now what? How do, you, how do you move this? What do you do with it? Um, everybody talks about an equity lens, and what is it? Uh, I just describe it as a critical thinking exercise. But if you don't know what questions to ask, then you don't know where to start. Certainly, individuals in, in the city don't know where to start. Um, so you get to decide what kinds of questions you want to ask and how you disseminate that in your city. Um, you know, an equity lens can, I've seen very extensive 
versions of an equity lens that people use. Uh, I'm not in favor of it because if, if it looks like a book that they have to complete, they're not going to do it. So how do you find the best but also most economical way to demonstrate? These are the questions you need to start with at the very least. And then we can go in depth uh, as we move forward. But you know, just starting so that everybody at least has four or five questions they automatically know to ask no matter what. And then moving into a, a, a deeper a deeper lens approach. And I know some of you have used them, and I know uh, uh, there's different ways to do it. So just different thoughts on it. Um, and how do you move it forward? Um, how do you move the idea of an equity lens forward? And certainly how do you move your version of it, the questions you want to be asked? How do you move that forward? Uh, so for me, it was a question of, Obviously, training because you can't ask people to do what they don't understand. And so, how do we begin the training? You know, can you get it to be mandatory? That's going to probably take you a minute. And so, it's going to be voluntary training. But how do you get folks to want to participate in that? So, for me, the starting point was obviously who, knowing who my allies and accomplices were, and, and directors of agencies. And starting with their leadership, I would be invited to come and speak to the leadership of the Parks Department or the Water Department. And so that would be the beginning of that, and that would then expand. And so the voluntary, it's voluntary, but many times it becomes mandatory within a particular department because leadership says, I want you participating in this training. And then it just expands. It probably took, in Portland it's mandatory now, it's been mandatory for a while, it took about two years to get it mandatory. Um, we did it through initially HR, because um, HR has its own mandatory trainings. And so you could sign up through the city's website through HR for the trainings, even when it was voluntary. That's how we got it begun to be kind of in the infrastructure of the city. We signed up through HR and it was tracked. And then when it became mandatory, then HR was the ones tracking it and would then notify supervisors if folks hadn't taken the training within the time period, et cetera, et cetera. So in the city of Portland, we ended up training, we've trained over 5,000 employees in the city of Portland in the almost six years I was there. Um, and in the training, you know, you're gonna get all spectrum of folks who either have an interest or believe or don't believe a word you're saying. And my approach was I'm not trying to change your mind, but what I'm telling you is that this is a city value, and so between 9 to 5 or 11 to 7, whenever you work, this is a value that you have to participate in. What you do the minute you get off the clock is up to you, but it's a city value, and it's professional development. It's not punishment. It's not diversity training. It's not beat up on white guy day. It's just professional development, so this this conversation and this value uh, can be performed and accomplished by everybody in the city. Um, how you define equity, there's lots of different definitions. You know, I, I, the short version of what we use was that, was that equity is realized when your identity can't predict the outcome. So it's easy to see, it's easy to understand, and you can look at data and know that your identity absolutely predicts the outcome. And so you can plug in any identity you want to into that definition and still use the same equity lens to get where you're trying to go. But certainly, as it relates to race, um, it, it fits our definition, the definition of what we did. Um, and then in trainings that you do, what are you including? Uh, implicit bias, privilege, equity versus equality, uh, systemic institutional racism. How are they able to apply then this new knowledge? Because my guess is if your city is like Lots of other ones I've been to, there are lots of conversations around race going on. And folks end up feeling guilty, and they walk out going, okay, I, I don't now know what, I, what am I supposed to do. And so that, for me, is honestly a, it's a failure. It's a failed opportunity. So how do you get them to know what they can do the next day they go back to work that moves the idea of equity forward, that they can apply this equity lens that you're talking about? How do we begin to apply the questions in any situation. I don't care whether you cut the grass. How do you, 
How do you make them feel a part of being able to participate in equity? If all they do is IT, that's fine. But how do they begin to feel and participate in the idea of equity? Because the end result of IT isn't city employees. It's the community who receives the benefit of what all city employees get to do on their computer. So allow them to flow through so that there's a connection to the community because this is all about benefiting community. Um, again, being able to answer the question why race has to be first. Uh, if you're familiar with John Powell, you know, he describes it as targeted universalism so that uh, the most at risk being the focus, if we improve the aspects for those most at risk, everyone will benefit. And so how do you describe to folks why race is first? Because they're wanting to default to any other conversation because talking about race is difficult for so many folks. And then what is the approach? Uh, is it institutional and systemic or is it individual and heart-centered? Uh, the work that I've done and did and promoted was focusing on and remaining at an institutional and systemic level um, as opposed to trying to change folks' hearts and minds, and I know it's a, you know, it's a debate, um, the two schools of thought to the approach. Uh, in my mind, I just didn't have the luxury of time for 5,000 staff to change their hearts and minds. So it was about understanding the institutional and systemic outcomes that they are involved in with no expectation that they're going to um, – there's no blame of anyone involved being racist or bigoted or anything else. Um, it was about the institution. And the data would demonstrate that the institution itself is racist by virtue of the outcomes for communities of color. And so it takes the individual blame away, but still allows folks to have their own epiphanies if, if they're really into that, thinking about it uh, deeply. Data. Data, data, data um, is important as well as anecdotal stories, but the data is, the demographic data gives you the picture of what it is and where you need to go or why you need to go or if you need to go. And so do individual departments collect data? Does the city as a whole collect data? Uh, what data do they collect? And is the data disaggregated? Often it's not. Uh, they have. They have aggregate data around something, but it's not disaggregated by race, certainly by gender, by geography. Um, and so how do you get that to happen? Um, and then what do they do with it? And are you involved, can you be involved with the engagement of the collection of their data? Can you ask for particular data? What kind of pushback do you get um, asking for particular data? Um, you know, the conversation is always, well, well, here's what I say. I always say that everybody wants to do equity until I describe to them what that means. And then it usually becomes lots of explanations about why it can't happen. It takes too much time. We don't have the resources. It's more money. Um, and the answer to all that is yes, yes and yes, if we're really serious about doing equity. And so it might take you more time. It might be something that you haven't done before. But if we're serious about doing this and that this is the mandate from on high, be it mayor, city council, whomever, then – I have, you have the authority to ask for the data and the questions that go with it. So let's see, did I skip a page? I think, oh, I did it, we're good. Um, so where to address equity in practice? Um, as I said, the policies, practices, and procedures I was gonna to come to get a little bit more in depth with. And so policies, are those written items, ideas, directives from HR, from contracting, from, you know, your city requires direct deposit of all paychecks. That, that's a written policy that you get to address or not address. Um, practices are, are the unwritten culture aspects of a department or a city, departmental, agency. Um, what are those practices? And, can that be identified? I would imagine if you talk to folks of color, they can certainly describe to you what the culture is and what the practices are um, that sometimes make them feel like they're outside. And then procedures are more, I define them as more of the expected tradition. You know, it's always been done this way. Um, you know, what's required to participate? 
um, I want to get a permit. So first I need this form, then I need this form, then I need this form. That's the procedures that get me to the outcome that I want. And so, well, it's always been done that way is, is the answer you get, but that doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. And so how do you engage employees and certainly leadership in understanding how to begin to look at these and address these? Um, my guess is everybody looks at you because this is all your job. This is why they're going to come to you to do this work. But it's not just your job, obviously. It's everybody's job. Um, at, at one point, <laughs> at one point I, I told the mayor that he needed to have a conversation with the head of HR because I was tired of doing as much work internally reviewing HR's policies when it was supposed to be their job to do. And so um, at some point, you know, how do you really push the needle so that you're getting other folks to do the work? You can, you can just, you get the directed, you get to at least provide examples of what it is that you're looking for, because you have to provide them the training and understanding of what's wrong with this policy. Um, you know, if you want all paychecks directly deposited, who's impacted? What are the assumptions that's based on? Have you thought about the woman in domestic violence who's never going to see that paycheck or the guy in domestic violence that's never going to see that paycheck? So what are the unintended consequences of those things? But you have to be able to, un to, to peel the onion and help other folks be able to peel that onion so that they're doing the work in their own departments because they have a greater expertise and knowledge of it than do you more often than not. And so some of that is in the training. Um, in the equity training, or you know, we did we just call it technical assistance. And so, how do you provide that technical assistance to individual departments? And typically, uh, when you're starting a new department, or you know, you're the equity person, uh, you're having to let everybody know what you do, how you do it, why the value added, what's important about it. So you're making all those calls, trying to infuse yourself into their work. And I will promise you, I'm sure many of you already know, that at some point that turns around the other way and you have way more calls and way more requests to provide assistance and technical review and everything else than you have time to do. And so at some point uh, it has to be a good chunk of their work and you're providing less technical assistance and more support than you're doing the review of their policies and their practices. Um, and so what we're really talking about, this whole conversation is about culture change. Um, so how do you begin to institutionalize culture change? And this can't, because it can't be dependent upon a personality, it can't be dependent on, upon who's sitting in any particular seat, upon who's elected, because electeds come and go. So for me, the focus was always on uh, leadership. and depending upon if you're in a city where there's patronage, the mayor goes, so do all the leaders. But how do you then begin to move that down the departments so that it's not just the director, but there are the managers, those people, uh, supervisors who are setting the culture every day and determine the climate every day and get to decide on a regular basis what happens, who rides with who in the truck on the way to the, you know, fix the fire hydrant. So really moving this down the department ladder, if you will, so that it's just not based on a particular leader or certainly you, because at some point you're going to be gone. So how does this, how does this stay once, once you are gone? So some examples in specific areas of the department. So I think we were, I mean, this has more been a conversation about the what, so now I'd like to get into a little bit about the how and the where you can do this work. Um, so starting with HR, just because, you know, diversity is the easy piece. And I will tell you that in, in Portland, in the almost six years that we were there, I was there anyway, um, we moved the needle of the, of the demographics of the city from about 16.5% people of color to almost 22% people of color. 
And so obviously in the city, 27% people of color now, um, which is a, you know, is a win. But for me then the central question or the secondary question became now where are they? Who are the managers and supervisors who are in the decision-making positions? So we can have a, we can have 22% of folks cutting the grass, but that's not the same thing as having a significant population of folks uh, who are in positions of policy making and authority. And so that really became uh, the next approach. And we we actually piloted a, a leadership mentor program and paired uh, leaders in the city with um, people of color from the city. We, we went through, we had each, the city had affinity groups. So we had the black, Latino, Asian, native affinity groups. And so from those affinity groups came the applications to participate in this mentorship program. So we did two things. One, obviously it improved the connectivity between uh, leaders and people of color in the city, but it also then benefited the affinity groups as they built their own capacity internally. So it was kind of a win-win both ways. Um, council loved it. We had presentations uh, from them to city council. We had presentations, some of the folks who were mentors were directors of city agencies. They presented to city council, the mentees then presented to city council. So it was just, it was a, it was a beautiful presentation. Council loved it and wanted to see how we could expand it. Um, as I've said, it's not much of a diversity conversation for me here um, because improving diversity does not necessarily mean we're improving equity. It's two completely separate conversations. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of folks in HR that have come from the diversity conversation and, and have a harder time moving into the equity policy review conversation. And so, so, and I have always found doing this work over the years, social justice work uh, of, all, of a particular kind, um, HR is sometimes the hardest, uh, hardest group to move forward because this is how we've always done it. Um, this is the policy. And so it's, it's so much, it, I found it to be somewhat difficult um, respect to all those of you in HR right now on the phone. Um, examples of, you know, policy review or education equivalents in, in job postings and job descriptions. Does everything require a bachelor's degree or how do you then translate uh, education requirements into or experience and this much experience equals this much education. Um, hiring panels, uh, bias training for hiring panels. There's um, no panel happen, no no hiring panel happens in the city of Portland without a bias training done by HR um, before that, um, just to make folks aware of the varieties of bias and and uh, affinity they will have for some folks and or uh, automatic bias against folks without they're even thought about it. So providing that uh, training to folks sitting on hiring panels. Um, job descriptions and the language regarding a multicultural workforce. This was a little bit of a fight in Portland as they uh, recently changed all of their, um, their classification language that hadn't been done in, I don't know, 20 years. And so for me, you shouldn't be able to describe a job and or um, the requirements for a job without being able to say now, that you should be able to manage and interact with a multicultural workforce. And that was a huge push. You know, for me, if the, if the language and classifications only get changed once a generation, this was the shot. And so certainly in job descriptions, this should also be there, certainly for managers or supervisors. Um, and the language also for me wasn't can you describe what equity is, for me it was, can you describe what you've done to move equity in the work you've done? That's two very different questions. And people in the city of Portland now know that on any hiring panel or any questions they're gonna get, they're gonna have to answer questions about equity. And so it makes the training more important 
because they have to be able to be responsive to questions and issues around equity in their job in getting uh, in these promotional opportunities. Um, police, police, police. Um, you know, I did a lot of work with police, a lot of training with police, um, from the command staff, the chiefs on down to just uh, the in services that they did. So again, two different things. One is data, and the other is training for me. Um, is data collected? A lot of places, a lot of cities do not collect stops data. Stops data is is just what it sounds like. It's the data that shows who are stopped at any given time by the police, why they were stopped, and what is their demographic along with other information. Um, not every city does it. It's not required um, in many cities. And so but what I will tell you is if, if the data is collected, more often than not it will show that people of color are stopped at significantly higher rates than white folks, specifically men, okay? But there will be greater hits on uh, weapons, weed, warrants on white men than on people of color. So the stops data is, I mean, it shows a complete distinction and disparity in who stopped versus what actually is found upon the stops. So if you know, I mean, the police don't know that, then they don't have to be responsive to the community in that way. So if the data is in fact collected, who's addressing it? Um, are there, is there community oversight groups, community engagement groups that are supposedly working with the police? Certainly as it relates to um, changing outcomes and their policy changes, use of force changes, things like that. Um, what's their training regarding or how do they engage and infuse the 21st century policing? The President's, um, excuse me, the President's task force report on 21st century policing. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. At least read the executive summary. Uh, it describes the six pillars, it's called six pillars within this report. Um, and it starts out with building trust and legitimacy um, with community. So it, it just it takes that approach and goes forward. And so your police department should be able to describe how they are utilizing that report and those six pillars in the training that they provide. Certainly it speaks to community policing, uh, it speaks to the need to provide de-escalation and disengagement training. Um, I mean, that's, those are kind of the new buzzwords for police uh, accountability and police training, of de-escalation and disengagement versus I'm here, why wouldn't I arrest them? As opposed to uh, they might need mental health services, they might need a number of things. And so how do you engage, or how do you get the police to respond to their engagement with this? And then have you visited the training center? Uh, and seeing what scenarios they're using, or how they're describing, how they're explaining, how they're how they're promoting the training of this type of work, community policing and disengagement or de-escalation. Um, the first time I went to um, Poland's training and watched all, there were four scenarios. Uh, three of them were shooting scenarios, which most cops will never do in their entire career. And one scenario then was about dealing with somebody with a mental health issue. So of those four initially, three of them were graded and one was not. I'll let you guess which is which. Um, the shooting was graded and the community, or the community interaction of somebody with a mental health issue was not graded, um, which is what most cops do on a daily basis. And so, you know, my questions were, uh, explain this to me. Um, and they, and they had lots of reasons. So anyway, um, now everything is graded, um, and they will have to go through additional training if they don't pass or do well enough. But it gives you a chance to see what the training is. So I would just encourage you to go through, at least watch some of their training scenarios. Um, public works, which is a variety of things depending upon what city you're in, water, wastewater, transportation, permitting, Okay, again, back to the data. Uh, is data collected? Uh, even by geography, because we tend to know where people live in our city. And so, you know, I used to debate with, at least early on, 
the director of the water department in Portland because he would say, I give water to everybody, so I do equity. Uh, my answer was, no, the hell you don't. Do you know who's on a payment plan? Do you know if everything that goes out to folks is in English? Do you know if people, what areas of the city are more on payment plans than others? All those kinds of questions. And so, um, again, being able to peel that onion for folks so they can understand what they do or don't do as it relates to equity. Um, you know, the work done more rapidly in a geographic area than another. Uh, I was doing a training for uh, the waste well, water department and had a room, probably 150 people in a room of, you know, mostly line staff. And I didn't even ask the question around race. I asked them, are you aware of areas in the city that receive preferential treatment just because of the area of the city. And more than half of the folks raised their hand and could describe to me the locations and exactly where and who gets preferential treatment. Um, you know, if the, the West Hills in Portland and in Oakland too um, get the preferential treatment because that's where a lot of the money is. And those folks know how to call their city council person and they will describe getting pulled off of one job to go and immediately fix something somewhere else. And there was a, in Portland, there was two fire hydrants in, on MLK, and it's like any other city, you know where MLK Street is. Um, and there were fire hydrants that hadn't worked in six months. And so they could very, very absolutely, very easily describe the differences in geography of who's getting services and who's not. So honestly, I just, after the training, I picked up the phone and called the director. I said, here's what I heard. Um, and, you know, he had all of his reasons why this is happening this way. And, I, and so my point was to him, that may be true, but if a significant population of your staff believe that the city is being, different parts of the city are being treated unfairly, you have a problem. You have a problem. And you need to figure out how to deal with that problem as well as uh, fixing the fire hydrant. So uh, it can give you a real snapshot of, of, uh, of what, without even specifically addressing race. Um, priorities and capital improvement projects, how are they decided? Is there an equity lens or equity component, equity component to the prioritization of capital projects? Um, there's different reasons, different ways, different uh, approaches to prioritizing um, which pipes we're going to fix um, in terms of wastewater. Are we, which types of risk are we going to use in the evaluation of where we put our next capital project? Which one is first versus which one is second? So where is, is there an equity lens in any of those conversations? Um, you know, illegal dumping, road repair, fire hydro repair, as I mentioned, just regular maintenance processes. Um, payment plans, do, do folks have data? Do they know? Is everything a complaint-only process, which by definition is inequitable? Because we know who is much more comfortable using a complaint process than not. And so is that a part of the conversation in a review of how they do what they do? Uh, and finally, is everything in English? Is it accessible only downtown? Is it only from Monday through Friday from 9 to 5? So who's impacted by that? Is there a satellite office? Can there be a satellite office? Can one day, if it's still downtown, can one day on a Wednesday be from five until? Are there late hours that can be had? So all of those kinds of things come into play and in part of the conversation, at the very least, to give people examples of how they can think about equity differently within the work that they do. Um, budget. If you want to know what's important to an entity, follow the money. And so where's the money going? I would imagine most cities can find where money is spent. There's a GIS map that can be put together purely based on money spent by geography in the city. Um, so is there any consideration of equity in budgeting? Uh, are, are there equity questions asked during a budget process, either by council, by mayor, by the chief administrative officer, by somebody? Um, where is equity in the process? In Portland, we, we put together 
uh, budget equity tool, which essentially was a bu budget impact, or an equity impact statement for budgeting, and rolled it out in year two and beyond, and it changed uh, some every year. The first year, it, it, it was not the best tool, but it certainly began to make everybody think about it. I got it implemented kind of late. Um, and so anyway, so as it morphed over the years, I engaged the directors in the conversation um, about how to do it, and it became a huge part of the process. I sit at city council now during the budgeting process and ask questions of directors as it relates to equity in their, in their um, budget requests. Um, how are the priorities decided? Is there an equity component to prioritization? I'm going to talk faster now because I'm at 15 minutes to go. Um, does, does the budget office review and or make recommendations on budgets? And if so, is there an equity lens in the budget um, reviewer's mind? We did training for budget staff so they could understand how to put an equity lens on the budgets they're reviewing. Because in most budget folks, they just say, I just do numbers, I don't do equity, which is not the case. So what are the outcomes? And so getting them on board was a huge win, and they began making recommendations based on an equity lens now. Um, and again, is there a um, budget map to control where money is being spent? Um, Parks and Rec, knowing their customers, you know, if if the majority of your customers are immigrants and refugees from Somalia, you pick a country, and your recreation programs are baseball and, you know, football, American football, you're not providing the services your customers need. So you have to know who your customers are. It was a hard sell in Portland. Because what we found was when we put together uh, a training and then they, they were asking questions from the front desk of who, you know, who are you, what's your demographic, and what programs would you like, what we honestly found was initially white folks would not ask the question. They wouldn't even hand out the surveys because they didn't want to have to deal with responding to any questions about why are you asking me my race. People of color, not an issue, either asking the question or responding to it. White folks had the most problems. And so it took a whole nother chunk of training and commitments by the director and the staff to really make this happen to know their customers. Um, you know, programmatic access and awareness, certainly Title VI, um, is a federal requirement. Uh, so how, do you, how are you ensuring that there's access, programmatic access, for all folks for parks and recreation? Um, are there different pro programs at different recreation centers? Um, one, of the, one of the pools had swim times for women only, so Muslim women who aren't going to get in the pool with men could be able to swim. And then it morphed into there were all, you'd be surprised how many additional women would much prefer to swim just with women. So it, it turned into, again, the benefit for a greater population of folks than just the targeted population. Um, translation of documents and material, again, it's a federal requirement, Title VI. Um, now, I say that. The city of Portland, the city attorney decided because typically it's a trans Title VI is transportation. But they decided that because it applies to one agency in the city, it applied to the entire city. So we could then use that as, an, as a way to push this idea of translation of documents. So that, you know, if, if you're having difficulty in your city, um, maybe there's a different way you can approach this. Um, is there overall funding or just individual, individual department funding to do translation of documents? Um, who's ensuring that it gets done? Is there an overall city policy or expectation for it? And what about phone calls? Does the staff know how to use language line or whatever that the city uses if somebody calls in and doesn't speak English well enough to have a conversation? How do you do that? Um, is there a pay differential for folks who are, you know, routinely called to do some translation or do interpretation just because they speak two or three languages? Is there a pay differential? Union questions, I understand. But it's also the possibility for a conversation in that regard. Um, not on here. Boards and commissions. Oh, whoop, that's on. It's on the next page. Sorry. Uh, boards and commissions. Um, so is the process centralized or decentralized? Again, are the demographics known? Because um, we're building capacity in the community. Um, how is information disseminated about openings on boards and commissions? What's the pipeline for that? Uh, and most importantly, sometimes, is there adequate training for community members who are new to the Robert's Rule of Order style of meeting. Uh, you can't just bring one person in and put them at the table, a person of color, 
and they haven't done this before, you, you're setting them up to fail or certainly putting them at a disadvantage. Um, and then do boards and commissions have equity training? They're making decisions, sometimes not just recommendations. So where are they in the equity training pipeline and component? Um, I would suggest that they, they often get left out and forgotten about. Um, citywide equity goals and statements, um, always a good thing. Um, is it a policy statement by council, by the mayor, by a county commission? Um, are they promulgated through the city and county departments? Um, can they be? Uh, honestly, I didn't do it at first because um, for me it was, it was much more important for me to begin getting things done so that I could put something under the umbrella of a policy statement of equity goals versus um, the big equity goal statement and then fill it. Uh, a little bit of both. I think I would probably do it uh, differently now. Uh, I think the, if you're talking about community, community really wants to see the equity statement or goals by council or by the mayor um, as, a, as the vision of where they're going, where the office is going. So um, it provides, uh, again, the foundation for being able to push some things forward because this is what city council has already said is our statement. Um, community, uh, how's leadership engaging around equity? Uh, they're even talking about it. At one point, uh, my second mayor in Portland, I told him that he needed to stop stumbling over the talking points that I was giving him and make this real or else I lose my bully pulpit. And so how are they continuing to utilize equity in conversation in, in what they're doing in their presentation? Who are they asking questions about equity? Is there regular reporting expected? Um, so uh, ensuring that leadership makes everyone know this is a priority. Oops, one more. Um, finally, um, reaching out to uh, other cities because, you know, you're all doing this work. And so supporting each other, but also trying to connect sometimes leadership of other cities. I, I had my directors talking to directors in other cities, and so it provided uh, my folks a sense that they're on the cutting edge of doing this work. And so letting everyone else know that they're not doing this in a vacuum was also important. Um, you know, other cities are doing this work. Like I said, GARE, Governing Alliance for Racial Equity, you know, National Civic League is moving this agenda. So how are we really having this broad conversation about this? Um, okay, I talked fast, talked too much. Um, that's the very short version of this. So I don't know if there's any questions, but I'm happy to answer some. Great, thank you so much, Dante, for sharing with us. Um, we have some questions coming into the chat box and feel free to keep sending them in to a private message to the host. Um, also just wanted to point out again, if you do want a 15 minute kind of uh, in-depth dive with Dante, go ahead and email Carla at Carla K at ncl.org to get that set up for later this afternoon. Um, so one of the questions that came in is to speak a little bit about the equity lens and what questions you would suggest starting with to build that out. Sure. Um, it's about benefits and burdens in some sense. So for me, if we're talking about a new policy or program, what are the assumptions underlying why, why to do this, um, which on some level talks about it gets into conversations around bias. Um, where, where are the assumptions on this? Uh, who's going to benefit from this? Who's going to be burdened by this? And why? Do you know? Then you need to investigate, um, either geographically, racially, gender, pick one, but who's going to be burdened? And then, and then the conversation is how do we mitigate for the burdens that we decide could possibly exist, unintended consequences of the direct deposit, unintended consequences of you know, not having uh, swim times for women. So what do we do? How do we, how do we begin to mitigate for some of those things? So, you know, there's a lot of different depths of conversation and questions you can get into, but just in, in terms of a framework, I think that's the, the beginning of what, what you need to be asking. 
Great, thank you. Another question that has just come in is to talk more about the leadership mentoring program. Uh, were the mentors people of color? Uh, they were not all people of color, no. Um, they were uh, directors. They were senior, manager, senior managers. Um, all the people, obviously, the mentees were people of color, but the mentors were not all people of color, no. Great. Uh, another question that's coming in is, um, how do you bring in the historical context um, of the city and planning and, and maybe uh, how the city had been a part of creating some of these issues of equity in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I used to say that the city was complicit in the disparities that got created and currently exist. I would, all, I would, I would say that, certainly in the training, if you ask me that I believe that the city of Portland was institutionally racist, my answer was yes. Does that make everybody who works for the city racist? The answer is no. And so um, that's what utilizing um, the university did. Uh, they provided a lot of that context, a lot of the data, a lot of the historical perspective, as well as the present-day present position of communities of color in the city. Uh, it clearly demonstrated that not only are folks of color maintaining the status quo, but we're going in reverse in many social indicators of success. Home ownership, housing, uh, education, uh, you pick it, employment. And so the data was really helpful by uh, the outside partners, the university, but also then looking at some of the laws that were on the books and the ordinances that were on the books in the city of Portland not too long ago that, again, uh, the ghosts of that past still existed in the policies and practices of today. Great, thank you. Um, so you talked some about um, the difference between diversity and equity and how that's a really important distinction to make. Um, can you speak a little to how you make that distinction, um, really how you get people to understand that equity is different from diversity? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, di by definition, diversity is about difference. Um, it, it's about um, numbers more often than not. Do we have this percentage of, or do we have two, we need two more women, we need two more people of color. Um, that doesn't change outcomes for service delivery. And so for me, it was about service delivery, no matter what your service was, whether you're providing water, whether you're providing recreational services, um, how are you changing the outcomes of your service delivery to better benefit communities of color? in a way that they haven't been benefited before. And so um, diversity is great, but if you stop at diversity, you haven't changed the outcome of what your, what your service is. And so it can be a benefit because obviously you get different perspectives with diversity, but diversity by itself doesn't change the outcomes of the services that you provide as a product of the work that you do. Perfect, thank you. We'll wrap up with uh, one more question that has two parts. Um, can you tell us some cities that serve as really strong models regarding equity and some specifically around new hiring um, practices and budget strategies? Um, I think Minneapolis is doing some good work now. Um, certainly, City of Seattle is kind of the OG doing this work. It was City of Seattle, then King County, then Portland. Um, so City of Seattle, King County, um, Portland uh, probably has the strongest budgeting component that I've seen of any of the other cities. Um, Tacoma's doing really good. Um, Diane and Tacoma's doing great work. Um, Darlene in Oakland is doing very good work. Um, they did a, she did a phenomenal um, presentation around equity and the medical and, and the marijuana um, component and addressing that. So I would certainly uh, let's let's a joy to read. Um, uh, New Orleans is just getting started with it. Um, but, um, so Minneapolis, Seattle, um, Portland, and as it relates to budgeting, um, Portland, I think uh, Oakland was in the process. I'm not sure where it is now. Uh, I think Minneapolis has also begun that. Um, so those just off the top of my head come, come to mind that I've interacted with specifically. I know we're doing some good stuff.
Great. Well, we have come to the top of the hour. So just want to say thank you again to Dante for joining us and sharing all of your expertise. Um, that was very helpful information. And um, the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will go out to you all shortly. Um, we encourage you to share it with your networks and spread this information. Um, we also had a request to send the contact information for everyone on this call so you all could um, speak with each other. So just wanted to put that out there. If, that, if you have an issue with your contact information being shared, uh, please email me at sarahl at ncl.org. Um, but I think it's a great idea to let you all continue to talk to each other and work through some of these issues because it's a very important topic in cities today. And obviously I'm happy to come and visit your city if necessary or possible. Um, I've you know, done this work around the country in several different cities and continue to do so. so. I look forward to at least seeing the work continue to grow um, because it's just such an important uh, component to um, improving life for everybody in our city. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, everyone.